All Quiet on the Western Front All Quiet on the Western Front is a novel by Eric Maria Remarque, a German veteran of World War I. The book describes the German soldiers' extreme physical and mental stress during the war, and the detachment from civilian life felt by many of these soldiers upon returning home from the front. The novel was first published in November and December 1928 in the German newspaper Fossische Zeitung and in book form in late January 1929. The book and its sequel, The Road Back, 1930, were among the books banned and burned in Nazi Germany. All Quiet on the Western Front sold 2.5 million copies in 22 languages in its first 18 months in print. In 1930, the book was adapted as an Academy Award winning film of the same name, directed by Lewis Milestone. It was adapted again in 1979 by Delbert Mann, this time as a television film starring Richard Thomas and Ernest Borgnine. The English translation by Arthur Wesley Wien gives the title as All Quiet on the Western Front. The literal translation of M. West and Nicht's Neues is Nth West Nothing New, with West being the Western Front, the phrase refers to the content of an official communique at the end of the novel. Brian Murdoch's 1993 translation would render the phrase as there was nothing new to report on the Western Front within the narrative. Explaining his retention of the original book title, he says although it does not match the German exactly, Wien's title has justly become part of the English language and is retained here with gratitude. The phrase all quiet on the Western Front has become a colloquial expression meaning stagnation, or lack of visible change, in any context. The book tells the story of Paul Baumer who belongs to a group of German soldiers on the Western Front during World War I. The patriotic speeches of his teacher Kontorek had led the whole class to volunteer for military service shortly after the start of World War I. His class was scattered over the platoons amongst Frisian fishermen, peasants, and laborers. Baumer arrives at the Western Front with his friends and schoolmates Lear, Mola, Krop and a number of other characters. There they meet Stanislaus Katczynski, an older soldier. Nicknamed Cat, who becomes Paul's mentor. While fighting at the front, Bummer and his comrades have to engage in frequent battles and endure the treacherous and filthy conditions of trench warfare. At the beginning of the book, Remark writes, This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all an adventure, for death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. The book does not focus on heroic stories of bravery, but rather gives a view of the conditions in which the soldiers find themselves. The monotony between battles, the constant threat of artillery fire and bombardments, the struggle to find food, the lack of training of young recruits, meaning lower chances of survival, and the overarching role of random chance in the lives and deaths of the soldiers are described in detail. They had been forced into the army. The battles fought here have no names and seem to have little overall significance, except for the impending possibility of injury or death for Baumer and his comrades. Only pitifully small pieces of land are gained, about the size of a football field, which are often lost again later. Remark often refers to the living soldiers as old and dead, emotionally drained and shaken. We are not youth any longer. We don't want to take the world by storm. We are fleeing from ourselves, from our life. We were 18 and had begun to love life and the world, and we had to shoot it to pieces. Paul's visit on leave to his home highlight the cost of the war on his psyche. The town has not changed since he went off to war, however, he finds that he does not belong here anymore, it is a foreign world. He feels disconnected from most of the townspeople. His father asks him stupid and distressing questions about his war experiences, not understanding that a man cannot talk of such things. An old schoolmaster lectures him about strategy and advancing to Paris while insisting that Paul and his friends know only their own little sector of the war but nothing of the big picture. Indeed, the only person he remains connected to is his dying mother, with whom he shares a tender, yet restrained relationship. The night before he is to return from leave, he stays up with her, exchanging small expressions of love and concern for each other. He thinks to himself, Ah! Mother, mother! How can it be that I must part from you? Here I sit and there you are lying, we have so much to say, and we shall never say it. In the end, he concludes that he ought never to have come, home, on leave. Paul feels glad to be reunited with his comrades. Soon after, he volunteers to go on a patrol and kills a man for the first time in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He watches the man die, in pain for hours. He feels remorse and asks forgiveness from the man's corpse. He is devastated and later confesses to Cat and Albert, 
who try to comfort him and reassure him that it is only part of the war. They are then sent on what Paul calls a good job. They must guard a supply depot in a village that was evacuated due to being shelled too heavily. During this time, the men are able to adequately feed themselves, unlike the near starvation conditions in the German trenches. In addition, the men enjoy themselves while living off the spoils from the village and officers' luxuries from the supply depot, such as fine cigars. While evacuating the villagers, enemy civilians, Paul and Albert are taken by surprise by artillery fired at the civilian convoy and wounded by a shell dot on the train back home. Albert takes a turn for the worse and cannot complete the journey, instead being sent off the train to recuperate in a Catholic hospital. Paul uses a combination of bartering and manipulation to stay by Albert's side. Albert eventually has his leg amputated, while Paul is deemed fit for service and to return to the front. By now, the war is nearing its end and the German army is retreating. In despair, Paul watches as his friends fall one by one. It is the death of Cat that eventually makes Paul careless about living. In the final chapter, he comments that peace is coming soon, but he does not see the future as bright and shining with hope. Paul feels that he has no aims or goals left in life and that their generation will be different and misunderstood. In October 1918, Paul is finally killed on a remarkably peaceful day. The situation report from the front line states a simple phrase, all quiet on the Western Front. Paul's corpse displays a calm expression on its face, as though almost glad the end had come. One of the major themes of the novel is the difficulty of soldiers to revert to civilian life after having experienced extreme combat situations. Remark comments in the preface that, this book, will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. This internal destruction can be found as early as the first chapter as Paul comments that, although all the boys are young, their youth has left them. In addition, the massive loss of life and negligible gains from the fighting are constantly emphasized. Top soldiers' lives are thrown away by their commanding officers who are stationed comfortably away from the front, ignorant of the daily terrors of the front line. Krop was in Paul's class at school and is described as the clearest thinker of the group as well as the smallest. Krop is wounded towards the end of the novel and undergoes a leg amputation. Both he and Baumer end up spending time in a Catholic hospital together, Baumer suffering from shrapnel wounds to the leg and arm. Though Krop initially plans to commit suicide if he requires an amputation, the book suggests he postpones suicide because of the strength of military camaraderie. Krop and Baumer part ways when Baumer is recalled to his regiment after recovering. Paul comments that saying farewell was very hard, but it is something a soldier learns to deal with. High is described as being tall and strong, and a peak digger by profession. Overall, his size and behavior make him seem older than Paul. Yet he is the same age as Paul and his school friends, roughly 19 at the start of the book. Hi, in addition, has a good sense of humor. During combat, he is injured in his back, fatally. Chapter 6 The resulting wound is large enough for Paul to see High's breathing lung when Himmelstoss, Himmelstoss carries him to safety. Mola is about 18 and a half years of age, one of Baumer's classmates, when he also joins the German army as a volunteer to go to the war. Carrying his old school books with him to the battlefield, he constantly reminds himself of the importance of learning and education. Even while under enemy fire, he mutters propositions in physics. He became interested in Kemmerich's boots and inherits them when Kemmerich dies early in the novel. He is killed later in the book after being shot point blank in the stomach with a light pistol, flare gun. As he was dying quite conscious and in terrible pain, he gave his boots which he inherited from Kemmerich to Paul. Kat has the most positive influence on Paul and his comrades on the battlefield. Kat Ksinski was a cobbler, shoemaker, in civilian life, he is older than Paul Balmeron his comrades, about 40 years old, and serves as their leadership figure. He also represents a literary model highlighting the differences between the younger and older soldiers. While the older men have already had a life of professional and personal experience before the war, Baumer and the men of his age have had little life experience or time for personal growth. Cat is also well known for his ability to scavenge nearly any item needed, especially food. At one point he secures four boxes of lobster. Baumer describes Cat as possessing a sixth sense. One night, Baumer along with a group of other soldiers are holed up in a factory with neither rations nor comfortable bedding. Kat Ksinski leaves for a short while, returning with straw to put over the bare wires of the bedstot later, to feed the hungry men, Kat brings bread, a bag of horse flesh, a lump of fat, a pinch of salt and a pan in which to cook the food. 
Cat is hit by shrapnel at the end of the story, leaving him with a smashed shin. Paul carries him back to camp on his back, only to discover upon their arrival that a stray splinter had hit Cat in the back of the head and killed him on the way. He is thus the last of Paul's close friends to die in battle. It is Cat's death that eventually makes Balmer indifferent as to whether he survives the war or not, yet certain that he can face the rest of his life without fear. Let the months and the years come, they can take nothing from me, they can take nothing more. I am so alone, and so without hope that I can confront theme without fear. One of Balmer's non school made friends. Before the war, Jaden was a locksmith. A big eater with a grudge against the former postman turned Corporal Himmelstoss thanks to his strict disciplinary actions, he manages to forgive Himmelstoss later in the book. Throughout the book, Paul frequently remarks on how much off an eater he is, yet somehow manages to stay as thin as a rake. He appears in the sequel, The Road Back. Kontorek was the schoolmaster of Paul and his friends, including Krop, Lear, Mola, and Bem. Behaving in a way that cost, him, nothing. Kontorek is a strong supporter of the war and encourages Baumer and other students in his class to join the war effort. Among 20 enlistees was Joseph Bem, the first of the class to die in battle. In an example of tragic irony, Bem was the only one who did not want to enter the war. Kontorek is a hypocrite, urging the young men he teaches to fight in the name of patriotism, while not voluntarily enlisting himself. In a twist of fate, Kontorek is later called up as a soldier as well. He very reluctantly joins the ranks of his former students, only to be drilled and taunted by Mittelstadt, one of the students he had earlier persuaded to enlist. Lear is an intelligent soldier in Baumer's company, and one of his classmates. He is very popular with women, when he and his comrades meet three French women, he is the first to seduce one of them. Baumer describes Lear's ability to attract women by saying Lear is an old hand at the game. In Chapter 11, Lear is hit by a shell fragment which also hits Burdink. The shrapnel tears open Lear's hip, causing him to bleed to death quickly. His death causes Paul to ask himself, what use is it to him now that he was such a good mathematician in school? Lieutenant Burdink is the leader of Balmer's company. His men have a great respect for him, and Burdink has great respect for his men. He permits them to eat the rations of the men that had been killed in action standing up to the chef Ginger who would only allow them their allotted share. Burdink is genuinely despondent when he learns that few of his men had survived an engagement. When he and the other characters are trapped in a trench under heavy attack, Burdink, who has been injured in the firefight, spots a flamethrower team advancing on them. He gets out of cover and takes aim on the flamethrower but misses, and gets hit by enemy fire. With his next shot he kills the flamethrower and immediately afterwards an enemy shell explodes on his position blowing off his chin. The same explosion also fatally wounds Lear. Corporal Himmelstoss, spelled Himmelstoss in some editions, was a postman before enlisting in the war. He is a power-hungry corporal with special contempt for Paul and his friends, taking sadistic pleasure in punishing the minor infractions of his trainees during their basic training in preparation for their deployment. Paul later figures that the training taught by Himmelstoss made them hard, suspicious, pitiless, and tough but most importantly it taught them comradeship. However, Baumer and his comrades have a chance to get back at Himmelstoss because of his punishments, mercilessly whipping him on the night before they board trains to go to the front. Himmelstoss later joins them at the front, revealing himself as a coward who shirks his duties for fear of getting hurt or killed, and pretends to be wounded because of a scratch on his face. Paul Baumer beats him because of it and when a lieutenant comes along looking for men for a trench charge, Himmelstoss joins and leads the charge. He carries High Westjus's body to Bummer after he is fatally wounded. Matured and repentant through his experiences Himmelstoss later asks for forgiveness from his previous charges. As he becomes the new staff cook, to prove his friendship he secures two pounds of sugar for Bummer and half a pound of butter for Jaden. Deterring is the farmer who constantly longs to return to his wife and farm. He is also fond of horses and is angered when he sees them used in combat. He says, it is of the vilest baseness to use horses in the war, when the group hears several wounded horses writhe and scream for a long time before dying during a bombardment. He tries to shoot them to put them out of their misery, but is stopped by Cat to keep their current position hidden. He is driven to desert when he sees the cherry tree in blossom, which reminds him of home too much and inspires him to leave. He is found by military police and court martialed, and is never heard from again. Hammaker is a patient at the Catholic hospital where Paul and Albert Krop are temporarily stationed. He has an intimate knowledge of the workings of the hospital. He also has a special permit, 
certifying him as sporadically not responsible for his actions due to a head wound, though he is clearly quite sane and exploiting his permit so he can stay in the hospital and away from the war as long as possible. A young boy of only 19 years. Franz Kemmerich had enlisted in the army for World War I along with his best friend and classmate, Balmer. Kemmerich is shot in the leg early in the story, his injured leg has to be amputated, and he dies shortly after. In anticipation of Kemmerich's imminent death, Muller was eager to get his boots. While in the hospital, someone steals Kemmerich's watch that he intended to give to his mother, causing him great distress on prompting him to ask about his watch every time his friends visit him in the hospital. Paul later finds the watch and hands it over to Kemmerich's mother, only to lie and say Franz died instantly and painlessly when questioned. A student in Paul's class who is described as youthful and overweight. Them was the only student that was not quickly influenced by Contour expatriatism to join the war, but eventually, due to pressure from friends in Contour, he joins the war. He is the first of Paul's friends to die. He is blinded in no man's land and believed to be dead by his friends. The next day, when he is seen walking blindly around no man's land, it is discovered that he was only unconscious. However, he is killed before he can be rescued. From November 10 to December 9, 1928, All Quiet on the Western Front was published in serial form in Fossisch's Eidung magazine. It was released in book form the following year to smashing success, selling one and a half million copies that same year. Although publishers had worried that interest in World War I had waned more than ten years after the armistice, Remark's realistic depiction of trench warfare from the perspective of young soldiers struck a chord with the war's survivors, soldiers and civilians alike, and provoked strong reactions, both positive and negative, around the world. With all quiet on the Western Front, Remark emerged as an eloquent spokesman for a generation that had been, in his own words, destroyed by war, even though it might have escaped its shells. Remark's harshest critics, in turn, were his countrymen, many of whom felt the book denigrated the German war effort, and that Remark had exaggerated the horrors of war to further his pacifist agenda. The strongest voices against Remark came from the emerging Nazi Party and its ideological allies. In 1933, When the Nazis rose to power, All Quiet on the Western Front became one of the first degenerate books to be publicly burned. In 1930, screenings of the Academy Award winning film based on the book were met with Nazi organized protests and mob attacks in both movie theaters and audience members. However, objections to Remark's portrayal of the German army personnel during World War I were not limited to the Nazis. Dr. Karl Kroner objected to Remark's depiction of the medical personnel as being inattentive, uncaring or absent from frontline action. Dr. Kroner was specifically worried that the book would perpetuate German stereotypes abroad that had subsided since the First World War. He offered the following clarification, people abroad will draw the following conclusions, if German doctors deal with their own fellow countrymen in this manner, what acts of inhumanity will they not perpetuate against helpless prisoners delivered up into their hands or against the populations of occupied territory? A fellow patient of remarks in the military hospital in Duisburg objected to the negative depictions of the nuns and patients, and of the general portrayal of soldiers, there were soldiers to whom the protection of homeland, protection of house and homestead, protection of family were the highest objective, and to whom this will to protect their homeland gave the strength to endure any extremities. These criticisms suggest that perhaps experiences of the war and the personal reactions of individual soldiers to their experiences may be more diverse than Remark portrays them, however, it is beyond question that Remark gives voice to a side of the war and its experience that was overlooked or suppressed at the time. This perspective is crucial to understanding the true effects of World War I. The evidence can be seen in the lingering depression that Remark queened many of his friends and acquaintances were suffering a decade later. In contrast, All Quiet on the Western Front was trumpeted by pacifists as an anti-war book. Remark makes a point in the opening statement that the novel does not advocate any political position, but is merely an attempt to describe the experiences of the soldier. The main artistic criticism was that it was a mediocre attempt to cash in on public sentiment. The enormous popularity the work received was a point of contention for some literary critics, who scoffed at the fact that such a simple work could be so earth-shattering. Much of this literary criticism came from Salomo Friedlander, who wrote a book at Eric Maria Remark Arkelich Galette. Did Eric Maria Remark really live? Under pen name Minona, which was, in its turn, criticized in, Hat Minona Arkelich Galette. Did Minona really live? By Kurt Tukolsky. Friedlander's criticism was mainly personal in nature, 
he attacked Remark as being egocentric and greedy. Remark publicly stated that he wrote All Quiet on the Western Front for personal reasons, not for profit, as Friedlander had charged. Wrote a parody titled Vor Troy and Ischt's Neues, compared to Troy, nothing new, under the pseudonym Emil Marius Rekwork. In 1930, an American film of the novel was made, directed by Lewis Milestone, with a screenplay by Maxwell Landerson, George Abbott Delaware Andrews, C. Gardner Sullivan, and with uncredited work by Walter Anthony and Milestone. It stars Louis Wolheim, Lou Ayers, John Ray, Arnold Lucy, and Ben Alexander. The film won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1930 for its producer Carl Lamley Jr., the Academy Award for Directing for Lewis Milestone, and the Academy Award for Outstanding Production. It was the first all-talking non-musical film to win the Best Picture Oscar. It also received two further nominations, Best Cinematography, for Arthur Edison, and Best Writing Achievement for Abbott, Anderson, and Andrews. In 2016, it was confirmed that Roger Donaldson will direct a remake of All Quiet on the Western Front starring Travis Fimmel as Kat Ksinski. In 1979, the film was remade for CBS television by Delbert Mann, starring Richard Thomas of the Waltons as Paul Baumer and Ernest Borgnine as Kat. The movie was filmed in Czechoslovakia. Elton John's album Jump Up. 1982, features the song, All Quiet on the Western Front, written by Elton and Bernie Taupin. The song is a sorrowful rendition of the novel's story, It's Gone All Quiet on the Western Front, Male Angels Sigh, Ghosts in a Flooded Trench, As Germany Dies. Bob Dylan, during his Nobel laureate lecture, cited this book as one that had a profound effect on this songwriting. On November 9, 2008, a radio adaptation of the novel was broadcast on BBC Radio 3, starring Robert Lonsdale as Paul Baumer and Shannon Graney as Kat Ksinski. Its screenplay was written by Dave Sheesby, and the show was directed by David Hunter. In 2000, Recorded Books released an audiobook of the text, read by Frank Muller. In 2010, a Shet Audio UK published an audiobook adaptation of the novel, narrated by Tom Lawrence. It was well received by critics and listeners. In 1952, the novel was adapted into comic book form as part of the Classics Illustrated series. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.